Uh, for those of you tuning in for the first time or who just joined, I'm Liz Watson. I run the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. We're a nonprofit organization that works to inform the public about policies that promote justice, equity, and fairness. So before we get started here tonight, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the continued uprisings against uh, the police murders of Black people that we have seen across the nation. Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Tony McDade are just some of the names of Black people who have been killed by the police. A culture of white supremacy and anti-Blackness has been deeply embedded in every institution in our nation since before its founding. Systemic racism pervades our institutions, including higher education, as we will discuss tonight. And I am very lucky to be joined here tonight by a wonderful co-host and expert uh, on the topic of higher education, uh, the Director of Higher Education Policy at Young Invincibles, Dr. Kyle Southern. So Kyle, thank you so much for joining here tonight. So tonight's dispatch is about the class of 2020 and COVID-19. Graduates right now are entering the worst economy since the Great Depression. It's staggering. Young people couldn't afford the crushing levels of student debt before this pandemic, and they certainly can't now. And frankly, it's not just young people who are struggling. About one in five families in the US struggle with student debt. That's 46 million people. And nearly 4 million people who are over 60 are still paying down a student loan. That's why so many progressive advocates have been calling for full student debt cancellation for a very long time. That's what Representative Omar's Student Debt Cancellation Act would do. Uh, you know, student debt cancellation is an idea with a whole lot of upsides. It reduces the, the racial wealth gap between white and black households in one study from 12 to one to five to one. It dramatically would increase our GDP and it would reduce unemployment. And perhaps most importantly, it renews our social contract in an important way. People who pursue higher education, which we want people to have the opportunity to do, will no longer be trapped in a mountain of debt. They'll be free to go out and get their education and contribute what they've learned to our society. And that's why these calls for full, full student debt cancellation have been picking up steam and now the calls to cancel student debt have become even more urgent. COVID-19 has exacerbated the legacies of inequality and discrimination that already existed in higher education and beyond. And we've heard this on a series of calls that we've had on dispatch from the front lines, focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on particular communities. We heard from Representative Deb Holland, about how tens of thousands of Native American students aren't able to access online education because they don't have access to broadband internet. We heard about how undocumented students aren't able to access federal loans and even how mixed status families were shut out of coronavirus relief, something that the HEROES Act seeks to address. Racism in our economy means that these same families face lower wages and higher unemployment. We know that the legacy of slavery and the persistence of anti-Black racism means Black families are forced to take on more student debt in order to access higher education. In fact, today one in three Black students who've entered repayment default on their student loans compared to just 13% of white students. And this is a reflection of the racial wealth gap and the systemic racism in our economy that we just discussed. So we know we're facing a crisis within a crisis, but student debt, student debt has largely been excluded from coronavirus legislation and the most progressive proposals were cut from the HEROES Act at the last minute. There's so much more to be done. And we have a leader in Congress here tonight who has taken up the mantle 
to get it done. So we are very lucky tonight to be joined uh, by a congressional champion for students, Representative Alma Adams. We are lucky to be joined here tonight by activists from across the movement who are fighting to make sure that student debt cancellation is available uh, to all students by, by Melissa Figueroa from the Cancel Student Debt Campaign, Figueroa, I'm sorry, from the Cancel Student Debt Campaign, by Adiel Polidor, the Program Director at Student Action, by Eddie, Angelica, and Sinales from Young Invincibles to talk about the student debt crisis amidst COVID-19 and what else needs to be done on the federal level to address these very acute problems that people are facing. So I'm so delighted now to hand the mic over to my co-host, Dr. Kyle Southern. Kyle? Thanks, Liz. It's a real honor to be with you and with all of our great speakers uh, this evening. Um, I serve as Policy and Advocacy, Advocacy Director for Higher Education and Workforce at Young Invincibles, which is a national nonprofit organization where our mission is to amplify the voices of young adults in the political process and expand economic opportunity for the young adult generation. We're here tonight to talk about one way to re-engineer higher education into a machine that advances social equity rather than one that perpetuates the educational and economic injustice it is so often enabled. Let's be clear, inequitable education is violence. It masks systemic racism behind a myth of meritocracy. And that's what we really need to work toward dismantling, here and now. Young Invincibles has worked to create a more equitable, fair, and affordable future for the millions of students who pursue higher education as a means of improving their odds at a better life. Today's students are more diverse than previous generations, but they are pursuing their dreams through a higher education system that was never designed to work for them. The rising racial diversity of the student population has been met with declines in financial support for public institutions of higher education. Many are first-generation college students, students of color, immigrant students, student parents, and students affected by our nation's mass incarceration complex. This all leads to students with a diverse set of basic needs, even as many take on large sums of student debt. But this arrangement was not inevitable. It's the result of policy choices that have been made at many steps along the way. We hear every day from young people across the country, many of them students of color and low income students, who are among the more than 43 million people carrying a collective $1.7 trillion in student debt. This debt is crippling, and it serves as an anchor weighing down young people from starting a family, saving to purchase a home, or providing a better life for their children and family. Policy choices exacerbated the college affordability and debt crises during and after the last recession, and we just can't afford to make the same mistakes again. That's why Young Invincibles strongly believe student debt cancellation with equity as the foremost concern has to be part of the solution. Failures of leadership and policy led us into this crisis and only a vigorous vision and dedicated investment in our country's future can get us out of it. So I'll stop there as a framing for this great conversation and thank you again, Liz and the Congresswoman and all of our speakers. I'm looking forward to our discussion the rest of the hour. Thank you, Kyle. And Congresswoman Omar was also planning to join us here tonight. Unfortunately, she is unable to do so due to the tragic passing of her father. Uh, our thoughts uh, go out uh, to Congresswoman Omar and for those who are so inclined to pray, our prayers as well. We send our condolences to her family during this very difficult time. Congresswoman Omar has been such a strong voice in Congress on so many important issues of equity and fairness, and we are grateful for her leadership, and particularly for her leadership in addressing the student debt crisis, and we are thinking of her tonight. 
And now I'm honored to introduce our special congressional guest speaker, Congresswoman Alma Adams, who represents North Carolina's 12th Congressional District. Congresswoman Adams serves on the Committee on Education and Labor, and she serves as the chairwoman of the Education and Labor Subcommittee on Workforce Protection. She's had a strong track record of advocating for students, and most recently, Representative Adams led a letter with Representatives Presley and Omar calling on our Congress to cancel student loan debt during COVID-19. Thank you so much for your leadership and thank you for joining us today, Congresswoman. I know this is an issue that is near and dear to your heart. So let's talk for a minute about how student debt is being handled uh, in the COVID relief packages. Uh, we know that in the COVID relief packages, uh, the student debt uh, issue has not been sufficiently addressed to date. Uh, while the CARES Act did provide a measure of relief to student borrowers, uh, it included a six month suspension on federally held federal student loans, which experts say uh, will leave an estimated one in five borrowers who owe on commercially held loans out. Uh, now, while it does uh, apply to 80% of borrowers and will allow 80% of borrowers to benefit from the suspension, we know that when the suspension is up at the end of September, Borrowers are going to face some very tough decisions between rent and food and making their loan payments. So there is certainly much more that remains to be done. The HEROES Act originally canceled up to $30,000 for everyone with student loans, but was later reduced to just $10,000 in cancel cancellation for those deemed economically distressed. Congresswoman Adams, can you talk to us about what more, in your view, lawmakers need to do to actually address student debt at the scale of the crisis that students and others in this pandemic are facing? Uh, what can we do for the students in the class of 2020 and the millions of other Americans of all ages who are struggling with student debt? Thank you for your question, Liz, and thank you for the kind introduction. First of all, I want to thank all the partners who convened this program tonight, to the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, to the Young Invincible Student Action, Freedom to Prosper. Thank you for your interest and for your leadership on this important issue of student debt. I also want to um, join you and, 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 and all of us here to, in sending my regards and condolences to Representative Omar for her loss. I had an opportunity to speak briefly with her on yesterday. Uh, she's been a steadfast advocate for the most vulnerable in our society, and I was proud uh, to work with her and Representative Presley on securing student debt relief in the HEROES Act. Uh, I don't need to tell you that today the total amount of student debt accumulated is up towards $1.6 trillion, uh, more than credit card debt, more than auto loans, it's student debt that prevents almost 45 million people from building personal wealth and contributing to our economy. Uh, there are a number of things that Congress can and must do to address this drag on our economic uh, productivity. Of course, if I had my way, uh, we would just get rid of all of it. We would just uh, relieve uh, these, uh, these students. But first of all, let me just uh, discuss in a little more detail what Congress has done so far to address the issue of student debt. Uh, as mentioned, uh, in March, we passed the CARES Act to not only place all students in administrative forbearance, which basically suspends uh, scheduled loan amounts until September 30th, but it also prevents any accumulation of interest until that date as well. So the CARES Act um, has a provision in it that, that allows the Department of Education to cancel federal direct loans if a student is enrolled in school and uh, are forced to withdraw due to COVID-related concerns. Uh, it was, however, and, and remains clear that Congress can and must do more. Uh, as a uh, college professor of, of 40 years, 
in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, I can tell you I understand uh, the difficulties that students uh, go through and uh, many of them are leaving uh, college and universities uh, with in insurmountable debt. But the first policy proposal that I championed after the passage of CARES was to create uh, parity between direct loan debt and other kinds of student debt, particularly debt accumulated under the, the Federal Family Education Loan uh, Program, which we refer to as the FFEL. It was phased out in 2020, 20, 2010, excuse me. There was no reason why direct loans should be treated as more privileged than any other form of student debt. So I was happy to introduce the Equity and Student Loan Debt Relief Act with Congresswoman uh, Stephanie, a uh, Republican Congresswoman. So we do things across the aisle. We need to do that. But it allows the FFEL loan holders to take advantage of the CARES Act. Now, I agree with those who say that we should go further and provide a private loan and Perkins uh, loan parity as well. And I was happy to see that the policy uh, was included in the HEROES Act. Additionally, there are other additional um, things that the Congress can do. Uh, we can allow student debt to be dischargeable in bankruptcy. It, 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 it is absurd to me that student debt is the only kind of debt that isn't dischargeable. Uh, it, it's also absurd to me to think about how much interest students pay, more than I uh, pay on my home and, and, those, and more than we pay on automobiles, but we can, ensure that we have strong borrowers defense rules in place that will grant for profit college students relief from student loan debt uh, while attending schools uh, making fraudulent claims. And I had a particular situation um, here in my district. Secretary DeVos has made it increasingly difficult for students who are victims of bad actors to seek relief uh, with the recent borrowers defense rule. So Congress will soon vote uh, to overturn that misguided policy with um, uh, House Res 76. So we can ensure that we will have a, a strong PSLF program that re rewards public service with full debt forgiveness. So, you know, it's really shameful how uh, this program has been mismanaged. But we can stop uh, taxing uh, loan forgiveness as income under current law, Americans must pay taxes on the amount of debt forgiven after 20 to 25 years. And that policy uh, limits the benefits of loan forgiveness, and that should be reexamined too. So, you know, sometimes when you have laws in place, and I've been a lawmaker for uh, probably more years than most of you are old, uh, you know, like 35 years. Uh, and I know that uh, there's some checks and balances that we must do, and we need to always go back and review those things that we've done. They may become outdated, uh, not useful anymore, but there are a number of things that we can do to help students. Uh, and the, but the one thing that we cannot do, and that's nothing. But thank you uh, very much for that question. Hi, Congresswoman, this is Kyle, and thanks again for being with us. And it's always good to be in the house with a fellow North Carolinian. Um, Liz mentioned your, um, your letter with Representatives Presley and Omar earlier that called for one-time uh, universal debt cancellation, which really couldn't be more timely in a time when we're facing an economy that's more stressed than any time since the Great Recession uh, and even going back to the Depression. Um, so I was wondering and thinking about the kind of job landscape that young people are going to face coming out of school. Could you talk a minute about um, what uh, relieving student debt would look like uh, in terms of benefiting the economy and jobs for the time after this crisis and COVID pass? Well, thank you, Kyle, for that question. Thank you for what you do uh, and for your support. You know, I want to list off a few statistics that, first of all, illustrate the benefits of student debt cancellation. Uh, a report by the Levy Institute from 2018 states that student debt cancellation would, first of all, boost a real GDP by an average of $86 billion uh, to $108 billion per year. Uh, it would add roughly 1.2 to 1.5 million new jobs 
over the first three years. And we're talking about people who have lost jobs as a result of the pandem pandemic. It will also reduce average unemployment rates uh, over 10 years. And those are what the, the fiscal studies say, but, but the lived experiences can tell us what it really means for our society. Think about it. Today, we have unemployment at levels not seen, as has been said, since the Great Depression. The class of 2020, uh, I'm sure that many of you feel that you could not have graduated at a worse time. Uh, but it is our responsibility, I believe, as lawmakers to ensure that you, your degree does not end up just being another piece of paper. It should guarantee you at least the opportunity uh, to have a better life. And the only way to ensure that it is the case to rebuild our economy from the bottom up. You know, we have to give working and middle class Americans disposable income to make those purchases that lift our economy. Simply reopening our economy is not going to be enough. So the best way to do that is to remove this albatross of student debt. Uh, you know, I've always said if we can uh, forgive Wall Street, we can go on Main Street and we can forgive uh, uh, these students and provide assistance to them. Uh, the, the greatest investment that the average person makes is buying a home. And the average price of a home is somewhere around 200000 uh, 200000 looks like a, a lot more steep when you also have $200,000 in student debt. Now, I, um, uh, I have two children, they're, they're, they're married and they have children. I have grandchildren in college. So I understand uh, the sacrifices that not only the students make, but their parents as well. Uh, it's doubly true for our black and brown borrowers who typically lack generational wealth. And I think Liz may have mentioned something like that, but it's not just purchases. Uh, canceling student debt can also allow our graduates to take those risks that have been the engine of economic uh, progress. Unburdened with debt, young people can start their, their own small businesses. They can create millions of new jobs in the industries of the future and, and, and make America once again the leader of innovation. Uh, we have so many young people here in the district uh, that I live in Charlotte where um, entrepreneurship is really um, a booming uh, thing. But of course, with the pandemic, uh, we have seen uh, some, uh, some fallout there. But let's not talk about uh, whether or not it can be done. I believe that we can do it. And so if Congress can pass a nearly $2 trillion tax cut for the wealthiest uh, uh, Americans as uh, the, the, the Republican Congress did in 2017, we can definitely cancel debt for ordinary Americans. And I, I just believe wholeheartedly that we have to give some debt to young people. You know, I, when my daughter uh, went off to college, I was happy to see her go. And of course, like most parents, we want our children to do better than we did. Uh, and um, you don't want them coming back home to, to live in the basement. You know, you love them and that kind of thing, but you want them to be able to make a good life for themselves. So being bogged down with this debt really creates a problem for them, for, for young people individually, as well as our economy. So instead of focusing on reopening our economy early, risking the health and, and the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans, we need to focus on rebuilding our economy and laying the foundation for decades of growth by canceling student debt. Um, listen, we started trying to put $30,000 uh, in that bill and uh, I was involved with that. And of course we, um, uh, we didn't end up with, with 30,000, but we're gonna keep working on it because I do think it's something that we really need to do. But thank you very much for your, for your question, Kyle. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for being a champion for for young people and for connecting it to your, your own personal life and to your own household. And um, I wanna take just a moment now to introduce our, our next speaker, um, Eddie Angelica Encinales, who is a program associate for operations and policy at Ascend at the Aspen Institute. In this role, she manages Ascend's internal operations that supports some of that team's policy and systems change initiatives in key states. She's also a founding co-chair of the Aspen Institute's Women of Color Employee Affinity Group, 
where she organizes activities to create a community for women of color in your organization. So Eddie, it's great to have you with us. And I think Liz may have a question for you. Thank you for having me. Eddie, we're so glad that you are here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to start off by asking you um, how student debt and the COVID-19 crisis have affected you personally. How, how are you doing right now? You know, it's, <laughs> thank you, Liz, for that question. It's definitely a, a interesting, weird, and, and tough time uh, for me, for my family, and, and for what I can assume most, if not all, of, of America right now. Um, I graduated school about five years ago, um, and I've been paying my student loans ever since. Um, and I have the privilege of working for an organization that has been very supportive about working from home. So I'm thankful to be fully employed um, and also to be healthy. However, um, my mom isn't in the same situation. So she has um, lost her job because of the pandemic. And it's really kind of rocked our, our, our family situation. Um, but because of the administ administrative forbearance um, that Congresswoman Adams mentioned, I have been able to channel some of the funds, well, all of the funds that I would normally use to pay for my loans. I've been able to put those to be able to help my mom um, with some of her finances. And this has been hugely helpful for her um, and for us as a family. I think, I think it's important to remember that people don't work in isolations. We're part of units and communities and families. Um, and even though this isn't like my unemployment, I, I am, you know, fully, um, it does affect me whenever she's, she's going through financial hardships. Um, so, because of this forbearance, I've been able to to support her and it's it's definitely helped me, but I am worried about what's going to happen in September when this forbearance ends and um, what if the economic climate doesn't improve and, and what if she can't find a job or, or if she's still facing hardships. Uh, it's definitely something that, that, you know, is, is going through my mind. And I assume this is the case for many other people facing student debt right now and going through financial hardships for them and for their family. And it affects our mental health uh, like this pandemic has already. And to add that, the, the pandemic itself and also everything that's happening with communities of color, I identify as a member of the Latinx community. And I know that um, communities like mine and, and the black community right now are, are going through, through, especially the black community is going through a lot. So if you just compound all of that, the, the mental health implications are, are huge. Hi, Eddie, this is Kyle. Thanks for sharing that. And um, I just, uh, I was just thinking as you were speaking about uh, your own situation, um, as you know, uh, Young Invincibles has been advocating for broad student debt cancellation, uh, both through the CARES Act and, uh, and whatever's coming up next. The Congresswoman um, alluded to how the provision for that got kind of pared down at the last minute. Um, in your own words, why do you think student debt cancellation is important right now and, and why is a broad-based approach that includes everybody uh, the most important thing to pursue? So I, I have to share a little bit about my story here. My loans, I have some of them that are under my name, but the bulk of the amount is under my mom's name, um, under Parent Plus Loans. Our arrangement, I don't come from a well-off family, so our arrangement since I was in school was that she would take on that debt and I would pay it back because, you know, the assumption was I would get a good paying job and, and that's been the case uh, up till now. Um, so if there was some sort of cancellation that didn't include parent plus loans, it wouldn't do a lot for me and for my family because that's the bulk of my payments right now. Mm -hmm. I know that my, uh, my experience is not unique. I, I went to school and I lived with two, three other women. Uh, two of them were uh, Latinas like myself and we 
all had the same situation. Our parents took debt under our name so that we could go to these schools. And then the arrangement was that we would pay those loans back. Um, I, I mean, we're not a, a hugely representative group, but I can assume how this is the case for many communities of color. Um, and if, if loan forgiveness does not include our families and does not think about families, then it wouldn't necessarily be as helpful as it could be. Um, and for me, loan forgiveness, and, and I want to echo the things that already Liz and, and Congresswoman Adams have mentioned. I I'm paying back my loans, but I'm not able to save a lot of money, and I'm not able to to you know save for a house, um, for grad school, for starting a family, and all of these milestone, these financial milestones that are significant. Not only because yes, I can have a house in the future, but also because these are the things that communities do to accumulate wealth. So this is stopping me from, from making wealth for my family. And it's also making sure that my future looks a little bit different and it looks a little bit harder, not just for me, but also for my kids, right? Like if I can't save for their school, then they're going to be in a similar situation. And that's something that I do not want. Um, so, and again, I know I'm, I'm speaking to the choir and repeating, but I really want to hone in on the fact that this is a good economic policy and it is also a great policy for equitability, especially because communities of color take on more debt than other community, than white communities. And we also have less wealth in some cases, um, maybe even negative. So, so it's very important. Thank you, Eddie, for those excellent points, for sharing your own uh, personal viewpoint on the issue, and also for talking about how important this policy is to, uh, to achieving equity. Um, and uh, just really appreciate your perspective and your being here tonight. Now, I am so pleased to welcome Adiel Polydor. Adiel is the Program Director at Student Action. Adiel is a Guyanese American organizer who works to build power for students and young people uh, on issues important to students, including on uh, the issue we're talking about here tonight, uh, student full to student debt cancellation, uh, and on the issue of free college for all. Um, and now I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Southern, to ask Adiel uh, her first question. Hi, Adiel, and thanks for joining us uh, tonight. Um, I was just wondering, given how many really critical issues and important there issues there are right now facing our country, um, could you just talk for a few minutes about how you got involved with this issue, this issue and why it's so important for you? Yes, definitely. So hi, everyone. Adiel, Program Director for Student Action. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I first got involved, like many people, when I was 17 years old and I was preparing to go off to college and I needed to figure out a way to afford going to college. Um, and so I took out about $20,000 in student loans um, to make that a possibility for myself. Um, and I think like many people, I always thought about education as a tool to help support me in my future. And so it was just like a sacrifice that I had to make. Um, reality did not really hit home until I graduated and I had kind of assumed that I would be in like a super high paying job and it would be a breeze and 20,000, not a big deal. That was not the reality. Um, I was uh, working as a community organizer. I was not making a lot of money. And as I started to make my repayment, I realized that there was no way to make sure that I could get all of those bills at the end of the month. And so I needed to take on a second job. So I started working a retail job on top of my organizing job, um, doing closing shifts, working the whole weekend, working, you know, like 60, 70, 80 hour weeks um, to make ends meet. And I am not alone in that experience. You know, we talked about tonight, um, the over 45 million uh, Americans who have student loan debt. And uh, it took me a really long time to realize that I was not alone in that experience, because there are ways that we 
talk about debt, well, first of all, we don't really talk about it very much. And when we do, we talk about it through the lens of individual responsibility and personal finance. And so it becomes really hard to see how your individual experiences of having debt, having to pay and take out all of these loans can be connected to something larger. And it makes it really, really hard to organize. And so a huge part of my personal work is I've moved more into organizing around student debt forgiveness and fighting for free college for all has been moving out of my own isolation and shame around my debt and actually move toward building um, collective power. Um, and so that's been like a really key part of the journey for me. And I, I think it's so important because we can't win if people are alone in their isolation and alone in their shame. Um, and so the process of actually like politicizing the experience of having debt and moving folks out of that has been really important for me. Thanks, Eddie. L. And can you tell us a little bit about as you're out there organizing people across the country, you know, what you're hearing uh, from young people about how they're coping right now with student debt and how they're thinking about their future? Yeah, this is a really great and super timely question. Um, I think that there's uh, the baseline fear that many people, uh, young, old, like everywhere in between are experiencing in this moment. And a lot of that fear is just connected to the uncertainty and unknown of this moment. Um, something else that I'm hearing in conversations with folks is like a sense that what we're experiencing right now is not new. So many young people's lives have been defined by moments of crisis, crisis after crisis after crisis, and this is just another one of them. Um, you know, graduating into this moment of like uncertainty, economic recession, high levels of unemployment is just another just another way that young people are currently being hurt by these systems that have been designed to fail them. Um, and I think that there's a cultural shift happening in the way that folks are actually recognizing that um, and creating spaces to name that and to talk about that. And so that's resulting, I think, in what we're seeing, which is that there's like uh, the this generation of young people are more radical and more politically engaged because they know what's at stake because they're um, experiencing that every day and it's clear that uh, there's a lack of leadership and there's a vacuum in leadership in older generations who are really willing to go to bat and take on the crises the mounting crises that young people are experiencing and a like full and holistic way. And so I think there is a sense of like, this is the reality and like we have to come together to like actually fight for the futures that we want to need because nobody else is going to do it. And I actually have found a sense of hope in that like reassurance and groundedness that like this is this is our fight, you know, this is the fight of our generation. Well, that's great to hear. And I do think we are living in a moment, um, obviously a moment that is that is filled with tragedy uh, on so many levels. Uh, we, we've been talking tonight about the pandemic within a pandemic that we're facing, but also I think we're living in a moment uh, with the potential for transformation. And a lot of that potential is because uh, young people across the nation are, are standing up and, uh, are showing us the way and are willing are willing to fight for the future uh, that we all want and need. So I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and thanks for the organizing that you're doing that's so important. Now, we know and we've talked about tonight that uh, one of the real uh, challenges that we see with student debt is that systemic racism uh, has meant that the racial wealth gap in particular uh, has left uh, black students with a much more significant debt on average than their white peers. So uh, the figures available from Freedom to Prosper show us that on average, uh, white students uh, are, are uh, leaving school uh, with $16,000 in debt as compared to $23,400 in debt for black students. So that's $7,400 more on average. Um, 
I thought it would be important to, to name and explicitly discuss uh, the relationship between the student debt crisis, the racial wealth gap, and systemic racism. So that's a lot, <laughs> um, but I was hoping, Adiel, that, that you could address, uh, address that relationship. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I appreciate some of the framing at the top of this call that like really helped ground some of this. Um, yeah, I just want to name that I think that we know that our society has many problems. We live in the society every day and we're navigating these systems that are failing us. And one of the messages that we're told is that education is a tool to help us navigate how all of these other systems are messed up and how they're failing. And that education can be used to help circumvent some of the failures of those other systems. And the truth of the matter is that that is a lie. Um, I think Kyle, at, at the top of the call, you were talking about the myth of meritocracy, and that's really true. Um, that education, higher education, is not an exception to how all of these other systems have been designed to fail, but a microcosm of the whole. And we're seeing that in the way that, uh, you know, students of color, Black students are um, particularly like subject to and taken advantage of when it comes to for-profit college scams, when it comes to predatory lend lending practices, um, you know, when it comes to the way that the military industrial complex does their recruiting. Um, and I think that one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is like, who is benefiting from the, the system being propped up in the way that it is and why? And when we look closely, we see that, you know, big banks are benefiting, student loan corporations are benefiting. And like I mentioned, the military industrial complex is benefiting um, because this is all existing within our system of racial capitalism. So that's how it's designed to work. Um, so with the cost of education rising and wages being really stagnant and also the way that we're experiencing disinvestment in public goods, with the exception of militarization and policing, disinvestment in public goods in many different forms and education is one of the key areas where we're seeing that, it's really important that we we challenge that. There are a lot of narratives that are being used to like prop up these austerity measures by talking about scarcity and there not being enough um, and really painting the picture of some people as being like less deserving as a way to kind of uh, build a, like a shared analysis an analysis words um, and agreement around disinvestment in public goods. And so it's really important that we are prepared to like challenge that and fight that as a key part of challenging the system of racial capitalism. And that's really why I do the work that I do with Student Action because I want to be a part of waging a long-term fight that is not just about reshaping the way that we think about education and the way that that's designed, but is actually thinking about how we are waging a fight for a better economy and a better, you know, country as a whole. Um, so, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Adiel, for, for your incredible work. Um, and for your remarks. Now I want to turn to Melissa Figueroa. Melissa is the National Coordinator for the Cancel Student Debt Campaign. She is a PhD candidate in geography at UC Berkeley and a faculty owner of the Cooperative New School for Urban Studies and Environmental Justice. That sounds extremely cool and I want to hear all about it. She has been a longtime political journalist, educator, and organizer, uh, and she's been involved in a wide range of movements for social, environmental, and educational justice. And I'm going to turn it over to Kyle uh, to ask you your first question, Melissa. Hi, and uh, thanks for, for being with us. Um, just, a, just an opening question. Um, you know, Liz was mentioning you're organizing with other young people and allies around a campaign to cancel student debt. Um, since this is such a personal issue for millions of people, including the ones on, on this call, um, what can people do to take action right now in support of a full student debt cancellation effort? 
Great. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, so I'm with student debt, uh, cancel student debt uh, campaign, which is really a coalition of many organizations who have been working on this issue for some time. Uh, the cancel student debt campaign, uh, the coalition was convened by Freedom to Prosper, who, which has been mentioned here. Um, I encourage everyone to go to freedomtoprosper.org slash resources to look at the um, amazing research uh, that uh, um, Freedom to Prosper has supported over the years um, to really uh, uh, you know, bring home the impact of student debt as well as the mechanisms that we can do to cancel it as well. Um, so Freedom to Prosper partnered with Progressive Democrats of America to create Cancel Student Debt Campaign and other organizations, including the Debt Collective, which has been working on both uh, private and public uh, uh, student debt, debt cancellation for a long time, as well as um, you know, student and faculty organizations across the country have come on to basically combine our efforts. Um, you know, this, this issue affects so many people and in so many different ways that, um, that being able to talk together, to analyze the issues together, and to strategize on actions together from a variety of different perspectives has, I think, really um, helped to kind of combine our efforts, you know, like a, like a Wonder Twins Activate, right? <laughs> um, to be able to, to, to really amplify um, all the work that's being done. Because like right now, again, not only is uh, this issue so urgent and even more urgent that the pandemic um, has created in the economic fallout from COVID, but also the opportunity to do so is, uh, is, is stronger than ever. And this is the time to take action. So right now, there, um, the, in, the, in the COVID stimulus, in the HEROES Act, right, there's $10,000 of student debt cancellation on the table. Um, now, while that, again, has been watered down from the original $30,000 um, uh, uh, request, uh, that's still pretty, si really significant, right? $10,000 of student debt cancellation is an effective total debt cancellation for almost 34% of current student debt holders. So um, again, that, that is, it, while, it's not, while it's still partial, it's something that is on the table right now that can really um, relieve it right now for a lot of people. Uh, the average student debt payment is about $400 a month, right? And at the same time, over 60% of Americans are so on the edge that they cannot handle a $400 emergency, right? So putting that $400 back in the pockets of people immediately is, would make so much of a difference. And not only that, it would provide proof of concept, right? for the economic benefits of student debt cancellation so that we can go further for full student debt cancellation. That said, there is full student debt cancellation also on the table in Congress right now in the form of HR 3448, which is the uh, Student Debt Cancellation Act of 2019, which was uh, introduced by Representative Omar and currently has 12 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. Um, and I would love to invite Representative Adams uh, to, uh, the, to, you know, consider that bill to review it and uh, co-sponsor it um, uh, as well. Uh, again, as we know, get enough co-sponsors that that bill can actually move out of committee and become considered on the floor of Congress. There's also the uh, uh, College for All Act, which is HR 3472, which will combine um, solutions for a lot of the issues, not just student debt, but also the core causes of student debt, which is the, um, the skyrocketing cost of college tuitions, as well as a lot of the hidden costs. You know, I mean, I have gone to undergraduate and graduate school. Uh, I have received a lot of uh, very competitive and, you know, substantial scholarships, and I still needed to take out student debt because as a low income first generation student of color, I still, I encountered a lot of these hidden costs that just aren't covered by, you know, uh, uh, student work contracts or anything like that. So 
Um, so, you know, those bills together, right, would relieve all the problems that we've been talking about this hour um, and, and also pave the way for a, a more equitable and a more just uh, uh, approach to higher education that would benefit us all. Thank you, Melissa, and, and thanks so much for your advocacy on this issue. You know, we often think of student debt as an issue that just plagues young people, but of course, this crisis isn't just harming young people. There are millions of parents who are paying on loans that they took out to support their children, and millions of people well into adulthood uh, who are still struggling under the burden of their own student debt. And this is 10, 20, 30 years after they took out the loans. What kind of action can people take right now to help families uh, who are struggling and to ensure uh, that parents who've taken out loans on behalf of their children um, can get some relief? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm uh, technically not a young person. I'm a Gen Xer. Um, and, you know, uh, I have, again, I have student debt. I've worked as an adjunct professor. Um, this, I guess a lot of uh, people think about student debt as being a young people's issue. But actually, what happens is that you don't actually feel the effects of student debt until you have graduated and are about to start your career. So what student debt actually does is it hamstrings people at the very point at which they're, they're supposed to be going into the careers, they're supposed to be establishing their lives, they're supposed to be establishing their own families. Not only that, um, like myself, I was a non-traditional student who actually did not uh, get my undergraduate degree until I was 31 years old. There's a lot of people who, you know, they get to a point in their careers where they know they have to get a degree in order to get a better job. So you're getting a lot of people who are coming back to school for a long time and also and, and incurring debt uh, in that way. Uh, actually, again, um, a, a huge uh, proportion of uh, student debt holders are over uh, um, over 65. There's it, it, it's a it's a uh, issue that affects uh, senior citizens. It's an issue that affects older um, Americans as well. Uh, I mean, one of my best teachers was somebody who had spent over 25 years paying off. Uh, her student, uh, her student loans, and was still not done, you know, um, after a long time. So, um, you know, this is something that, it, you know, it crosses, it crosses demographics, it crosses uh, age uh, lines, it crosses even party lines. Um, you know, uh, student debt cancellation is widely supported by voters across the spectrum. Right. And this is it's not just a, you know, uh, this is an issue. It's an issue that affects everybody. And we can, you know, use that to build a grassroots movement that can support the efforts that are currently on the table in Congress. Um, you know, one of these you know, to 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 really say that, look, this is so many people across the spectrum support this. It's it should be a, you know, a no brainer. Right, especially now as the economy is trying to recover, as you know, businesses are reopening. You know, businesses need customers, right? Um, and people need relief from the financial pressure that they're feeling at this moment. So I do think that now is a really, um, it's, it's time. It's time for, um, for both grassroots uh, organizations that are directly, uh, um, you know, interfacing with people who are suffering from student debt, as well as uh, you know, uh, people in Congress and people who have influence in the political sphere to really come together. Um, you know, as we've seen with, with many other issues, including gay marriage, including, um, you know, marijuana legalization in some states, right? Um, we can, we've shown how, you know, uh, the thinking and the action on many issues that affect us can change very quickly. And I do believe that this is one of those moments for student debt. Um, one of the things that uh, Freedom to Prosper um, has uh, put up is a petition to fully cancel student debt 
for everyone. And uh, the uh, as we've seen here up on the thing, uh, the um, you can go to this link or you can go to directly to freedomtoprosper.org and click on the link to sign the petition. That's one thing that we can do. Um, and also get on the list because as the student debt campaign, um, you know, we've done letter drops to uh, Congress members, uh, you know, work uh, at, at, at certain times. Uh, you can get on that list and we can that will email various actions that you can take um, at times to uh, to further this issue. It really is um, a time when you know it's it's uh, it, it's it's really good for people to get together and with our combined uh, action in whatever sphere that we're in, we can make this happen. Thank you so much, Melissa and. You know, I want to let you know that you addressed a question that so many of our listeners wrote in with, uh, which was to say, you know, are, are, are you all working to make sure that lawmakers know that it's not just uh, young people who are struggling with debt? We have Jean uh, who wrote in and, and many others and Jean said, I'm 76 and I'm still paying off my student loans. So, uh, you know, thank you for the advocacy to make clear that uh, it's people of all ages who need this relief. I'd like to jump in with a couple of other questions from listeners, uh, some really nuts and bolts questions for our panelists. Uh, we heard from Elena, uh, who asked this question. I know that there were some freezes in the relief packages for students, um, suspensions uh, of student loan payments, but only on some types of loans. What are the types of loans that those suspensions were available for? I want to know if my loan would qualify. And so I want to open this up uh, to our panelists and see who would like to take this question. The question is, what are the types of loans uh, that were suspended uh, under the relief packages through the end of September? And Kyle, I'll also open it up to you to answer that question if you would like. Uh, sh sure, I'd be glad to. Um, under the CARES Act, those suspensions are for federally held uh, loans. Uh, the Congressman mentioned earlier that doesn't apply to, to older federal loans that are held by private servicers, so FFEL loans. So you'll need to check um, the status of that, those tend to be loans that were taken out before 2010. Um, and then also, as the Congresswoman mentioned, privately held loans uh, would not be covered. So it, it does cover the, the vast majority of outstanding loan debt, um, but there are definitely uh, significant pockets of the overall landscape of student debt that isn't covered by the repayment suspension. You should have received an email before April 10th from your Servicer, so the, the firm that actually takes your money to pay off the, the, that loan. Um, so by April 10th, they, they were required to notify borrowers who did qualify for suspension. So I would say if you didn't receive one of those, check with your servicer or your loan provider um, to see what options you might have. Um, some have been flexible and how they uh, might reflect the suspension as well. So it's gonna have to be something that you work out individually. Thank you uh, for that. And then I also want to raise a question from Mateo, who asks, how does this affect people who didn't graduate, who had to work and raise a family, so left school, took the loss, and, and took the debt? Um, and I I think, can, yeah, I can, I can look into that because, um, you know, I've uh, not only like myself, uh, I haven't finished my uh, PhD uh, degree yet. Um, you know, thankfully, I didn't have to take out loans for that it degree. Happens, but I, I had to take. You. I'm sorry. It happens. I promise you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but you know, I've had to take out other degrees for my undergraduate and another graduate degrees, and um, you know, it's really hard, especially again if you're trying to decide you know, whether or not to pay your rent or eat, or especially if you have a family to raise a family and have to, you know, juggle between that and a $400 uh, student loan payment, it's, it's just not possible. 
You know, um, I think it's already one in four student loan debt borrowers are already in default because they just can't afford to do it, right? Those loans don't go away whether or not you have a degree or not, um, you know, and of course, as we know, without a degree, it's really, it gets hard, it's harder and harder and harder to find any job nowadays that it, uh, pays a living wage. Um, even, even if you do have a degree, again, 75% um, of the academic workforce today, meaning the lecturers, the adjunct professors, um, and the non-full-time staff um, in, in universities uh, are not paid a living wage. And so even the people who are in the universities right now teaching our students are burdened, uh, overburdened with student debt. And so, um, you know, uh, um, this is why full student cancellation really is the goal here, um, you know, and, and, and to be able to make these, uh, make education accessible um, to, to everybody, um, you know, these barriers to participation, to having a better life, um, you know, need to be, need to be cleared in order to close the racial wealth gap in order to for you know our the next generations to have a future um, i think it's millennials which is the first generation that's not doing better than their parents and so um you know and and these barriers including the student loan debt trap is a huge huge part of it this is one thing that can be that can be done right away to just clear those barriers so that you know we can we can provide a future for our children Mm -hmm. that, that, that's all that's all right um and thanks for for that um uh, melissa um, i would just add going back to the the previous question about the cares act um unfortunately um it it does not provide cancellation for those students who took out loans and then didn't finish a degree um so you even if you don't have that degree um the cares act um like most of the other loans would pause your repayment through September, um, but it doesn't provide any kind of substantial um, cancellation. Um, so there's there's more promise in the in the Heroes Act or some other legislation coming up, um, but it but you should expect to have those re those payments start back up after September, um, even if you didn't finish your degree, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so I want to, um, I know at folks are joining us here late, and I want to be sure to um, give people some of their evening back. Uh, this has been a really absolutely terrific conversation. I want to uh, quickly acknowledge my absolutely outstanding uh, team. Uh, led by uh, Jessica Warren Scruggs, who put this event on tonight uh, and, and did the production. Uh, great job, comms team, and thank you once again. And then I want to really thank our terrific uh, panelists, Melissa and Addie L and Eddie and Congresswoman Al Alma Adams, who let me know she had to jump to her next call. Uh, during during the presentation, uh, and my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Kyle Southern, uh, it's been just a terrific uh, a terrific conversation, and I'm really grateful for the outstanding advocacy. You know, I think this is a moment where so often um, we you know we we are living in a crisis every single day uh there is a a new disaster a new tragedy and this is a moment in which um i really think it's important to to recognize the work of outstanding advocates and leaders like the folks on this call who are taking ideas that were once um, something that, that really no one was talking about and putting them on the national stage. Um, full student debt cancellation is an idea that, that you, are, you, are, you have decided is, is here to stay and something that we need to take up uh, if we are going to address systemic racism, if we're going to close the racial wealth gap, if we are going to make America a place where people can actually achieve the American dream where that's more than, where that's more than just words, right? So, um, 
really grateful uh, for the work that all of you are doing and inspired uh, and inspired to keep fighting. So um, that's my thanks to all of you. I want to turn it over to Kyle uh, to also say his thanks and um, uh, and just really keep up the good work and we look forward to continuing to work with all of you. And also thanks to those on the phone who've joined us here tonight. Kyle. Thanks, Liz, and thank you and your team for making the space and time for this uh, really important conversation. Uh, it's really made by the folks who informed the conversation, all of our panelists who were great. So thanks for taking your time and, and bringing your expertise to this conversation and your personal experiences. Um, I often find that data points kind of come and go, but stories stay with you. And so that's the most important thing I think to take um, from this conversation. Um, I also want to thank uh, the whole team at, at the center and all of our partners and as well as at Young Invincibles for, for signing on to be part of this. And we're looking forward to working in partnership and continuing to advocate for, for young people and on this important issue uh, for the future of our country. So thanks everyone. And to our viewers, uh, thank you because you could be doing a lot of things tonight, but you chose to spend an hour with us talking about student debt. So we appreciate your time and your passion for this topic as well.